Okay, today I am with Steve Jones in the Cotswolds. Thanks very much for talking to us today, Steve. Uh, no problem, up until son. recently, you were Temple Gate of the Sun, but now you're doing something else. Yeah, I, my number came up in the redundancy raffle. It seems to be spun uh, quite often in the newspaper industry these days. So yeah, I was 15 years there and um, about 25 in total in journalism in general. And uh, now, yeah, I've been let free. So it's been quite enjoyable. Just uh, started a column in the Mirror last week, uh, be once a week, and uh, I've got a few other things lined up. Uh, some tipping, some a bit advisory role, and uh, still doing uh, a bit on racing TV, which is great. So, yeah, enjoying it. I didn't even realise it was allowed to go to the Mirror from the Sun, but obviously, you've, <laughs> obviously it is. But before we go on to your journalist work and what you're doing, uh, I was quite surprised to learn that you come from a family of jockeys. Your grandfather won the first Gold Cup after the war, is that right? Yeah, Davy, um, who died when I was about 18, I think, um, was quite a remarkable fella. He was very well. She came from, in, bear, bear with me with the pronunciation, but he was from Knethley, and uh, he was a proud Welshman. And when he was uh, 10 or 12, his parents had a haulage business, and obviously in those days, it was all horses. There was no um, great big juggernauts like you get now. And uh, that's how he had his, because um, he had a real bond with horses. He, he didn't have a lot else in his life other than horses. And uh, he came to Cheltenham to work for a guy called Ben Roberts. And uh, yeah, he, he started off as a jump jockey and rode the Cheltenham Gold Cup winner in 1945, it was called Red Rower, and if you read the books, it says that veteran jockey D.L. Jones, well, he then rode for another 30 years on the flat, so God knows what he was when they kicked him out at 65, because he rode till he was 65, they wouldn't give him a licence, so he promptly went to Kenya, uh, and rode over there, rode the winner of the Kenyan Derby, set up a, a, jo a jockey school for um, natives to, to Kenya and he, he'd ridden all around the world at that point um, I think Singapore certainly in India and various other places when you, you used to have to get the boat there so uh, he was quite a remarkable chap and being Welsh it was quite coincidental he died on St David's Day 1st of March and was buried during Cheltenham Race Week so it was quite quite an apt end for his life. And didn't he um, <coughs> ride in the same race as uh, Leicester Pickett rode his first winner? Yeah, he was second to Leicester when he rode uh, his first winner as a 12-year-old up at Haydock on the chase. And there's, I've got endless pictures of him with Piggott and Gordon Richards. I've got a menu um, of the dinner to commemorate Gordon Richards' retirement from, with all, signed by all the top jockeys at the time. And he, he was, um, he, having rode for that time, he rode with like the top legends of, of the sport. And... Uh, yeah, all over the place. And then your father continued the tradition. Yeah, my father and my uncle. My father, Peter, was a jump jockey, rode a couple of hundred winners, um, started off on Cleve Hill with Bill Marshall, went on to ride for Alec Kilpatrick a lot, who was at the stables, Herridge, where Richard Hannan's yard is now, and rode um, the grand annual winner for um, Michael Scudamore and uh, finished fifth in the Grand National one year on a horse owned by Fred Pontin, the big holiday camp boss. And uh, I think he said to him uh, as he came in on a horse that they renamed Go Pontin or Pontin Go, and he pushed the ears off it for two circuits because it was, it'd been around those fences a few times and it, it was getting a bit sour. And having pushed it for two circuits, Fred Pontin said, would have finished fourth if you were a bit fitter. <laughs> so that was good to hear. <laughs> and tell us a bit about your uncle Buck. He rode for Ryan Price. Yeah, he was second jockey to Ryan Price behind Josh Gifford. Um, and when Josh Gifford and, and Ryan Price were warned off, he got he got on some of the big ones. Uh, he rode what a myth, I think, um, a couple of times. And in fact, he, he rode uh, the Imperial Cup winner, a horse called Invader, when they were warned off for, for Sid Dale and that book. He finished second in the Hennessy uh, on a horse called Ferry Boat, I think, an Irish horse, and the winner was Arkle. So the family have finished second to some some big names in the sport, you know. So you didn't fancy becoming a jockey yourself? Um, far too fat and lazy. I mean, I wish I had 
try to to write because I I wasn't much of a scholar and um, when I left school I, I drifted around quite a lot so uh, I w wish I'd done something more because I wasted a lot of years early on and uh, before I finally realised that I'd be doing that kind of thing for the rest of my life I didn't pull my finger out. Did you not, did they, no one ever put you on a horse and you know sort of in your early days? I rode ponies and things like that but um, I was even at that stage my school in, involved um, cutting the next day's cards out of the paper and uh, running a book and stuff like that and it was all punting based more than riding. I was fascinated by, by punting and at the time there was horses like Desert Orchid and all those um, great horses of the 80s so it was um, yeah it captured me from an early age punting rather than riding but I do wish I'd done something a bit more constructive. So your school work suffered, is it safe to say that you were a blatant non-trier? Yeah, probably, yeah. Spent a lot of time looking out the window. So the cold hard facts of life, when you left school, you ended up in a factory. Yeah. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, I did. Um, well, funny enough, when I was at school, we went on a geography field trip and I remember being summoned to the front of the bus and thinking, oh God, what have I done now? And uh, the geography master said, uh, dentist this week Jones I said no sir and he said dentist this week Jones and I thought what is he on about and then I twigged that he was basically saying if you want to go to the races because it was it was March festival week and I only grew up the other side of Creek Cleve Hill from from the track and he was basically saying if you want to go you'll do us a favor and we get rid of you for the week and that was the year that um Beach Road won the champion hurdle that's the first day I went to the Channel festival it poured with rain and uh, I, he was on my radar beach road and I backed a horse called Moleboard instead, 25 to 1 each way. And we were in the middle of the track, me and a friend, couldn't hear a thing. And uh, suddenly it crackled into the PA that Moleboard jumps the last in front. And I thought, oh, I've cracked this game. And then, of course, he f faded into fifth or sixth and uh, in, in beach road came winging down the outside at 50 to 1. That was the first one that got away then. Um, so, you ended up on the Gloucester Echo. Now, there's a fair jump between being in a what, fa what factory was it? So we didn't get to that bit. Oh, it was some factory in Tewkesbury making lorry parts. And uh, well, I, it's funny enough, I, I drove past. Um, I was in Cheltenham one evening. And I drove past the local college, and it had an open day. And I went in, and I signed up to a course, and then went in the the next day to work, and handed me notice in because I realised that. I, it was a long old time till I was 65 doing those kind of shifts. So um, I was very lucky I got out of that. And then a friend of mine's uh, dad, Paddy Wood, uh, was um, a director at Cheltenham Town Football Club who were in the depths of non-league at that time. And he said they were looking for someone uh, to do radio reports for, for the Robins. So I did that. Started doing bits and pieces community-wise for the Gloucester Echo and then got to, taken on for a, as a trainee. Um, by an editor called Anita Sivre, who was the first female um, editor of an evening paper. And when we had the interview and she said, oh, if you'd like to join as a trainee, then we'd, we'd like to have you. And she said, have you got any questions? And I said, well, how much am I going to be paid? And she said, they're effing peanuts. And so I started on them the next Monday. <laughs> so you went then, so how long did you stay at Gloucester Echo? I think it was three or four years, something like that. So did you ever get to get involved with the racing in that? In that? I didn't. It was a, a chap that a lot of people might know, Jonathan Herbert, who was very good. Um, he did the racing because there was a big presence in the in the paper generally for racing. So I was just a news reporter and uh, it, it was a, a very good grounding, which actually I think that isn't there anymore. Local papers have been obliterated and uh, it, it's... It doesn't do people who want to be journalists any good to go straight into it. I think they need to, the training on good local papers was invaluable. Okay, now then you found yourself working as an analyst at Raceform Interactive. How did that come about? Yeah, I, I spent a couple of three years in Leeds working for SportingLife.com in the early days of the internet, which was fantastic fun because we were all of the same sort of age, mid twenties, and uh, all we in wanted to do was go punting and drinking and there was people like Rob Brady who's uh, 
high up at Corals now, and Dave Ord, who's still at Sporting Life, and George Primarola, and, and various other people there. And then, uh, obviously, I, I was quite keen to get down south and uh, join Raceform on the papers, which were, the, in those days, the Raceform update, the Racing Football Outlook, and um, the Raceform on Saturday. And I think I'd been there three months, and uh, we all got called in, and Bruv Scott and... Uh, various other high up people come in to say that they were shutting the office at Compton near Newbury, well just down the next village from East Ilsley and moving it to Canary Wharf. Well that wasn't very attractive going to London so uh, I did a couple of months for the Newbury Weekly News and then uh, came back to Raceform as a, as a race analyst and on Raceform Interactive helping Rodney Pettinger runs that. So in, the, in this period between leaving school and um, getting to race one. Were you a serious punter at that point? I probably thought I was. Probably, I mean, through phases like I think everyone does when they, they start punting, you think you can crack it back in odds on shots, which is when you look back and you think, good grief, you must have been absolutely crackers and uh, various other things. But um, we all loved, especially at Sporting Life and race form, there were some really knowledgeable people. I learned a lot at race form from really clever people and uh, we used to have ferocious arguments about horses whether they'd stay or not and uh, things like that and mock everyone but it was just the enjoyment of at that stage definitely of, of punting rather than thinking that um, we were going to make millions. So would, was mixing with those sort of people at race form a bit of a, a pivotal moment when it came to punting? Yeah well um, Mark Coton who was the original price wise he was editor of the race form on Saturday and a very clever bloke. And you just, it, it sort of all rubbed off. You picked up little pieces from here and there. And uh, it's good to see that some of the guys, especially who are still there, Ron Wood has now carved himself a niche in the American racing. Not that I'm massively into that and I like ribbing him, but he's, he's really knowledgeable. And there's people like Stefan Edwards and, and a few others that really know their stuff. So did you leave race form being a bit, and being a profitable punter? Um, but certainly more profitable than, than I was when I joined, that's for sure, definitely. Um, you got to know, it was the early days of Betfair as well, don't forget. So it was perhaps easy, if you were ahead of the curve on Betfair a little bit, you could certainly make more money than, uh, than you perhaps can on there now, because there was a lot of people who didn't really know what they were doing at that time, and I'm not sure that's the case now.